Thank you, Father. Well, this would be part five as we continue. Part five, uh, time to grow up, part five. So how long will this go on for, you ask? Well, I don't know. I thought we would conclude today, but I'm not going to put the limit on it. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because the more I stay with a theme or a subject, the more I see, the more revelation I get. And it's really exciting because I think sometimes we do a, a disservice in the church. You know, we give these high powered sermons and, and then I got to have a new one next week and then a new one the week after. And it's like, well, why? Why not just stay with the theme and glean what you can from it? And then we'll know when it's time to move on. OK, so part number five, it's time to grow up. And I'll start off with um, uh, with this statement that it is prideful arrogance that is leading many to destruction. Uh, prideful arrogance is leading many to destruction. Uh, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. And if we're not careful, if we allow a prideful, um, if we allow a, pr a prideful arrogance or a prideful spirit to remain, uh, it will cause us more problems than we want to deal with. And the sad thing is in the time that we're living in, deception is on the increase. People don't even know that they're deceived and they don't even know that they're being duped and that they're wrong. They think everything's okay. And that's part of the deception is to think that we can do what we want, when we want, how we want. After all, this is America and we're going to be just okay. And God's going to have to just get in line with my program and he's going to have to just be okay with how I live my life and how my feelings are. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to work out very well. But yet you know as well as I do that that's exactly where we are in the history of our great land. This, this American experiment is winding down. Man, oh man, where did that just come from? It is the truth. And we are so close now that I'll tell you how close we are that I'm actually afraid to go away and leave you for a week. Man, I'm struggling. Struggling, struggling, struggling. There are no prophecies left to be fulfilled for the rapture of the church. It is imminent. There are things that have happened in my lifetime and recently that I've never seen before. But we are that close. We are that close. And I know that you have to continue to do uh, what you do and to be faithful. You have to continue the program and the process. You can't just shut down because the rapture is going to happen. You have to continue. But in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I mean, it's going to be so quick. There's not, there are no signs. The rapture or the catching away is signless. Now, there are plenty of signs for the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, if there were and there are many prophecies that were fulfilled leading up to the coming when he came 2,000 years ago and we knew he was going to come a certain way and be born in a certain place. And there are so many things that you, all the boxes have been checked. And if it was so spot on accurate at the beginning, then we know at the end we can depend on it too. Right. Well, where is the second coming? Oh, it's you hang on. It's coming. He's coming. But what has to happen first? The rapture or the catching away of the church, which simply means that in the moment in you're going to go. Phew. You're going to be caught up to meet him in the clouds. And in the process, your body will be changed because this mortal body cannot inherit the next life. You know that. So those who have died uh, before the rapture, they had to leave their bodies behind. So every saint, every child of God, every believer, every man and woman of faith who has died had to leave the body behind. So the first thing is at that last, that trump sounds, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. In other words, the Lord's coming to claim the body in whatever form it is, whether it's been cremated, whether it's at the bottom of the ocean, the Lord's going to claim the body first, first. OK, that's how important your body is. He's not leaving your body behind. Your body is important, you know that, right? He bought and paid for it. And this is Communion Sunday, so I think that I see where the Lord's taking us already. 
Your body is very important. So the first thing is, if you had to experience death, he's claiming the body, and the body, soul, and spirit will be rejoined, but the body will be made new. And then we who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now the second advent or the second coming is when the Lord will actually come back with us and touch down on planet earth again. Right now he's touched down on planet earth through you. But we're going to come back with him. Uh, we're going to have our resurrected glorified bodies. You know Paul said something interesting. He said, Paul said, talking about you having a legal matter and going before legal authorities uh, with a brother, a dispute with a brother or a sister. He said, don't you guys know that you are going to judge the world? Don't you know that you are actually going to judge angels and you can't handle these little civil affairs? And when I read that, I went, huh, <laughs> wow, we're going to judge the world. We're going to judge the angels. I don't know what God has in store for us, but I want to find out. How about you? So I'm going to live right. I'm going to live ready and I'm going to be right and I'm going to be ready. And so prideful arrogance has no place in the kingdom of God. Now, when I say a prideful arrogance, I am not talking to a about a bold confidence. There's a difference between a bold confidence and a prideful arrogance. Prideful arrogance has no place in the kingdom, but you need a bold confidence in order to maintain and hold on to what the Lord Jesus purchased for you. And as I think about the things that are going on, things that are going on in my own body, in my own family, in my own church, my community, wherever I am, things that are happening, I realize that the Lord had been preparing me for this time because Christianity, real biblical Christianity, is not for the weak or faint of heart. The Lord said the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You've got to have a bold confidence, not a prideful arrogance. It belongs to me, so therefore I'm going to take what's mine, and I'm going to hold on to what's mine because the Lord Jesus said, hold fast to what you have. Why would he tell us to hold fast to what we have if there was not a risk or a chance that we would lose it? <clears throat> now, we are self-governing. All of us are self-governing. You know that that's true. You make your own choices in life. And someone said it this way, you made your bed, now lie in it. So you make your choices, and then you will have the consequences to go with those choices. But we are self-governing, meaning that if we're going to be more like Jesus, then we will self-deny. But if you want to be more like the devil, you continue to self-exalt, just like the devil did. Self-exalt and self-promote. He said, I will, I will launch my throne up into the stars. I'm going to be like God. That's what Lucifer said. And it was prideful arrogance that got him kicked out of his position or kicked him off of the throne that he had. God had given him a place of esteem and honor, a great place of esteem and honor. And so it all depends on the attitude of the mindset that you cultivate and develop. And it's not very popular today to talk about self-denial. That's not what we do. What do we do? We self-exalt. We self-promote. If you just look at your society, if you look at the culture in which you live, you will see that that has never been more true than it is right now. Self-exalting. Self-promoting. This is how I feel. This is how I don't feel. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. You're, you all are just going to have to be okay with it. So God does give us everything that we need to override what I call a universal internal default setting. Every one of us has a universal internal default setting and it is set to self. We are born with it. That's the sin nature. That's the nature of the devil. We all have this internal default set to self and it must be overcome. And it can be overcome by the things that God has provided. What has he provided? Spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines meaning, do you discipline yourself to pray? 
on a regular, consistent basis? Do you discipline yourself to study and read the Word, not just speed read it with the one-year Bible? <laughs> yeah, I read the Bible again this year. What'd you get out of it? Oh, it's good, man. I know I'm getting spiritual blessings. You don't know nothing, do you? I'm talking about meditating the Word of God. He's given us spiritual disciplines. Also in Ephesians 4, he's given us ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher for the perfecting of the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. And he's, giving us, he's given us each other, the assembling of ourselves together. These are things that God has given to us. Okay, So this past Wednesday, we left off talking about visions and revelations and Paul's thorn in the flesh. Now I want to bring you over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you would, find your way all the way over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Thank you, Lord. Now I don't know about you, but my flesh does not always want to do the right thing. I don't know about you, but like Paul, I've got to handle myself roughly. I've got to keep my flesh or my body under. And I have to tell it what it's going to do where it's going to go. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to read, uh, beginning in verse 1, I want to read the first through the fourth verse. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety, so through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4, For if he that comes preaches another, preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Now, I want to have that verse 4, Chief. Oh, could you put that up in the uh, English Standard Version if you have that, that verse 4 in the ESV? If you have it, if not, we'll go to the NLT, New Living. If you don't have ESV, let's go to the NLT. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 4, NLT. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believe. So the New Living says you happily put up with whatever. What are you putting up with? You can put up with whatever, and God will allow it because you are self-governing. He made you this way. Whatever you put up with, that's what you are going to have. Not what God wants, because God's will does not automatically come to pass in your life. It's whatever you put up with. It's whatever you tolerate. It's whatever you will deny or whatever you, or whatever you will permit. This is a great lesson that people need to learn and too often we find that people are throwing everything back on God. Well, if God wants it to be this way, it'll just be that way. No, it won't. Because God wants every man to come to repentance and to be saved, but every man is not coming to repentance and being saved. You know it as well as I do. Is there nobody going off into eternity without Jesus? Of course they are, right now while you sit here. Well, how come? God wanted them to go to hell? Absolutely not. What did he send Jesus for? So that whosoever will receive him and believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Amplified says, you tolerate all this welcoming deception. You tolerate all this welcoming deception. Now let me show you verse, verses here in the same chapter, verses 13 through 15. For such, a, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And, verse 14, no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, 
Therefore, verse 15, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The good news. Chief, we got the good news? Good news translation, that would be GNT. If not, no worries. I'll give you just a second there. Got to be quick to work. Nope, that's fine. The good news says they disguise themselves to look like real apostles of Christ. Now remember what I said in Ephesians 4. The Lord Jesus gave some to be apostles. Not all of them are. There are some who disguise themselves to look like real apostles. You cannot have a counterfeit if there is not a genuine. Have you ever, please raise your hand. Have you ever seen a counterfeit $3 bill? Raise your hand. And do you know why? Because there's no genuine $3 bill. But there are fake 20s, 50s, 100s. I don't know what the most common is, but there are counterfeit bills only if there is an original, authentic, right? So there are original, authentic, Christ-given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But there are some who disguise themselves to look like real apostles of Christ. And Paul is saying, you're putting up with this stuff that you're getting, this other additional information, revelation, or a slant on something. You're putting up with it, happily putting up with it. And I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that you're, you're being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So there's some real issues going on some real problems going on that are being accelerated at the end because Jesus said one of the characteristics of the end time, uh, it would be marked by deception. And people are being duped and deceived at the end in an alarming rate and they are not following God's program to override that universal internal default. They are not following God's program because they think they know better than God. But they won't say it that way. They may say something to the effect of, well, you know, we have the Holy Spirit now. I don't need any man to teach me. Or I have a gift and a call on my life, so I don't have to do this. Well, let me tell you something. You will never not need this. You will never not need this. Never. I don't care how high and mighty you think you are. But see, understand this. In order to be deceptive and fraudulent, you have to look good. You have to look like the authentic. So no one's going to get right up there and say, I don't need this. I'm advanced. I got the Holy Ghost. I got a gift of God. I got a call of God. Besides, I worked hard all week. It's my day of rest. I'm only obeying the scripture. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. So, on to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So in chapter 12, Paul said, obviously, the context is, and if I could say it this way, listen, there's a lot of fraudulent stuff going on out there. And it's not always easy to tell the difference. You guys need to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I don't want to boast and brag about myself, but I need you to understand that I got a hold of some stuff. This is what Paul is saying. Paul says, verse 1, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Credibility, in other words. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and he heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now, we know that Paul is speaking about himself. He's speaking in the third person. But I've got to be honest with you. I've never, to, to the best of my knowledge, I've never been caught up to the third heaven. Have you? Because if you have, I'd like to hear about it. What did you see? What was it like? I don't know. I've never been there. I, I don't know. I really, I have to, everything that I'm giving you, I'm giving you by faith. 
I'm giving it to you because it's in the Word of God, because there is a call of God on my life and an anointing and a gift so that it helps me give you what you need. But I can't say, hey, I went there and I saw and heard some stuff and now I'm coming back to report to you. I ain't never been there. Spiritually, absolutely. I've had my own experiences that we talked about, we touched upon and we'll come back to. I've had my own experiences. And I was able to say, wow, this was really amazing. But here's the thing. You may have had some marvelous experiences. Maybe you have been to the third heaven. Maybe you've seen Jesus himself. Maybe God has given you some insight into some things. But here it will always line up with the word of God. The word is your, the word is your safety net. Anything that you have happened to you that you experience that cannot fit within the Word of God, you got to discard it, man. If it goes against the Word of God, you got to get rid of it. Because this is the only safety, this is the only safeguard truly that we have is the Word of God. You have to become a stickler for the Word now more than ever in these end times. And I'm not talking about any word, I'm talking about the revealed, the 66 books that you have from Genesis all the way to the maps. You have to understand that. Are there other inspired writings that perhaps could have fit within the pages? Of, yeah, absolutely, but I don't have them, and I ain't going for anything outside of this. This is what I go with. That's it. If it's outside of this, I stay away from it. And anything that I see or hear, uh, uh, what we might call a vision or a revelation, it better fit with this or else. I don't want to have nothing to do with it because I know that deception is on the increase and there are those who masquerade, who, who push themselves off as being someone special, if you will. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So what's, I mean, all right. So his ministers or his servants are going to masquerade the same way. And as an angel of light, it causes you to stop and say, oh, we had a glorious experience today. Did you see that? Did you see the glory of God on him or her? Oh, it was marvelous. Well, so, something on the, your knower will know something is not right. As long as you follow God's program, your knower will stay sharp and active. Don't ever override that. And, and, and I've, I've had to cancel, and I'm not saying I'm doing this, I've had to cancel many trips. We've been packed and ready to go, and at the last minute, something wasn't right on the inside, and we canceled. What did you do with all that money? Lost it. Well, that's not being a good steward. If I bypass and override the Spirit of God on the inside, I'm a fool. Because they that are the sons of God are led by the prophets of God, right? By the Spirit of God. If you are a child of God, you are led by the Spirit of God, which will never violate the Word of God, because the Word and the Spirit always agree. So I will not violate and override. That means I could be on my way to the airport. That means I could be walking into the terminal and the Spirit of God is all, and man, it's just telling me, dude, you ain't going. I'm like, you know what? I ain't going. Goodbye. Turn around and walk out. What happens? Don't know. I just know that I obeyed and I responded. Now, I'm not saying that that's what's happening. I'm not saying that at all. But it has happened. And so here, Paul is telling us he got caught up into paradise. He heard verse 4. He, man, he said, I heard some stuff that I can't even talk about. I paraphrased it, of course. I heard some stuff I can't even talk about. Of such, verse 5, uh, I'll, uh, of such and one will I glory, yet of myself I will not, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And, verse 7, and, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 7, again, and lest I should be exalted above measure. He's not talking about prideful arrogance in this verse. This is not prideful arrogance. Another translation said to keep me from becoming conceited. Uh, some, some translations may something to the effect of to keep me from becoming conceited or prideful or arrogant. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. 
The abundance of the revelation, if you receive revelation and insight from God, it will exalt you above measure. You will see things, know things, you will experience things, you will be able to accomplish things above what the norm is. Well, you can't do that. Well, I just did it. Well, how did that work? Well, it, it just did. And see, one of the great revelations that we have learned and that we see is the finished work of Christ has already been finished as it pertains to your redemption. That your sin is not standing in the way. It does not stand between you and God. It is simply your neglect or your refusal to receive what he's already done for you. And so there are things that we are tolerating and putting up with that we don't have to simply because, well, that's what everybody else is doing. That's what we did at my last church. That last denominational thing I belonged to, that's the way it was. That's the way it'll always be. No, that's not the way it is because I've got some insight and revelation because I've studied it out. I've seen it in the Word. God has showed me some things like taking me to the cross that Honestly, folks, we are tolerating way too much. And we are pushing it back on God and we're saying, well, this is the way he wants it because if he wanted me to be free from this cancer, he would just do it for me. He did just do it for you. Do you know that Jesus took and bare cancer in his body on the tree? That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed? 1 Peter 2, 24 is were past tense or future tense? You were healed. What does that mean to you? If you were, then you was. If you was, then you is. If you is, then you am. I am the healed of the Lord. Right now, I'm not trying to be. I am the healed of the Lord because Jesus took it for me and I've got sickness and disease, pain and suffering tried, trying to attach itself to me. Why does it come at strategic times in my life? Well, because your faith will be contested and challenged. It's all in an attempt to confuse me to say, is this the Spirit of God telling me not to go? I'm so sick, I don't even know if I can take this trip. Well, normally when sickness and disease comes as bad as it does, I press through it because it's, it's an attempt from the enemy to stop me. I listen to my heart, I don't listen to my body. Because if I listen to my body, I don't get out of bed most days. I wouldn't have got out of bed this day. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. What is the thorn in the flesh? He tells you what it is. A messenger of Satan. Sent from the devil himself to do what? To buffet him. Buffeting meaning wave after wave of opposition. A buffeting. Wave after wave of opposition. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul was able to see and hear some things that the others did not. Paul received what I call an x-ray view, a behind-the-scenes look. And I got all this from Buzzy, by the way. This is the revelation that I got from Buzzy. So it's important who you hang around and who you listen to. Not everybody understands what it means to be in Christ. Not everybody understands uh, what it means to be a new creation. Not everybody understands what it means to have gone through the divine process and, and what was accomplished. Not everybody understands that Paul the Apostle had some insight that no one else had as uh, referenced by Peter. When Peter said he writes that way in all of his letters, it's, some of that stuff is hard to get with. And so when you, when you study out the Pauline revelation, when you study out, it, it, it's more than just, oh yes, Paul had an assignment to get the gospel to the Gentiles. Guys, it's more than that. That's it? Well, yeah, Peter went to the Jews, Paul went to the Gentiles, and that's it. Same gospel, same everything, no change. No. I'm, I'm sorry, but as you study out the Pauline revelation, as you study out the things that Paul writes, you will realize Paul had some insight that the others did not. And we have clearly established in previous lessons prideful arrogance, prideful arrogance is the downfall of many. It started with Lucifer. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Pride, the condemnation of the devil. It's what got Lucifer kicked out of his position in heaven. He was cast down to the earth. The third of the angels who followed him, they got ejected or expelled out of heaven. And now Lucifer is forever known as Satan, the devil. 
So Satan understands, listen, this is important. The devil understands the value of prideful arrogance. What do you mean? It will always accomplish the opposite of what God's trying to do in your life. You can count on it. It will always accomplish the opposite of what God's trying to do. God is trying to lead you in a certain way. God's trying to get you to grow up in Him. God's trying to get you to a place where you understand fully who you are and what you have. But prideful arrogance will keep you going in a different direction. And you won't even know it. Usually people that are full of themselves don't know they're full of themselves. They don't know that they stinketh, but they do. And so if the enemy understands the value, the phew, if he understands the twisted, corrupt value, Satan understands the twisted, corrupt value of prideful arrogance. Let me ask you this. Why would he want to keep Paul from becoming prideful? Because that would lead to Paul's downfall. Read it again. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. It is absolutely, completely wrong for anybody to think that the devil was going to do whatever he did to Paul to keep him humble. Are you out of your mind? You must be crazy. Think about this. If Satan wanted anybody to get full of pride, it would be Paul. It would be Paul because Paul, we have Paul to thank for most of your New Testament. We have Paul to thank for some amazing things that help us understand who and what we are. The position that we have. We have Paul to thank for this. And so Satan had a messenger assigned to Paul to keep him from getting this revelation into the body. And here's the thing that blows my mind, man. Paul's writing your New Testament from prison and he gets his head whacked off at the end. He gets beheaded. And I'm like, you would never know by his writings that that's the circumstances he was in. Paul goes from being an elevated, esteemed colleague at a prestigious university, a fellow in this or that and the other thing. He had more degrees than anybody knows what to do with, right? Here's Paul, he goes, he's at the top of the food chain and all of a sudden he finds himself in prison. Why? Because of his faith in Christ. Hallelujah. And Paul goes from the top of the food chain all the way down to the bottom of the barrel and he said, don't matter for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I don't know what I'm going to do, man. I want to stick around for your sakes, but you know what? I want to go and be with him, which is so much better. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, you got some choice. Right. Well, evidently, Paul seemed to think he had some saying in whether he stayed or went. Hey, so do you. You have some saying. So the messenger of Satan was simply there to keep Paul not humble, not from becoming prideful. Satan would want him to be prideful. Satan would want him to become conceited, but simply to keep a wrap on, or wraps, keep this revelation under wraps, if you will. Too late. In my own life and ministry, I saw the difference of starting off uh, at a basic, what I call a basic evangelical level. Of course, I started off in the Catholic Church, and so that gave me uh, headache. I mean, it just gave me a wonderful... No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There certainly is a, there is a way, the Catholic system gives you a way to worship, correct? Okay. But then you, you, you step on up into the evangelical uh, mindset. And, and through my own life and my own, my own personal history, I can see a step up here and then a step up there. And so what the Catholic Church did for me is gave me a base. I, I knew and believed in one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is my sure foundation. I believe that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I believe in the virgin birth. No question in my mind that the Lord Jesus came through a virgin. 
I mean, the Catholic Church gave me this foundation, right? Okay, so now we begin to build on that. And so in my own life and in, in, in ministry, my own personal experience, I see a step up. And so what the enemy would like to do is to keep it under wraps and to keep you at a lower level. He doesn't want you to take a step up because every time you take a step up, you do more damage to the kingdom of darkness. You are more of a threat. Because now you know how to pray. You know how to get your prayers answered. You know how to speak the word. You know, you know how to hang on to the word. And you know how to overcome. How do you overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. The word of your confession. Not by begging and pleading with God to please do something he's already done. You ain't going to overcome nothing that way. And so finally now, God calls me into a, to go to a Bible school that really focused and majored on faith. The faith principles. I had no idea that faith was so complex. I had no idea that in the same, uh, by the same token, or on the flip side of the coin, not only was it complex, but it was simple and easy. Yes, faith is a complex subject, but it's also a very simple subject as well. And I didn't understand that. I mean, I thought, I thought like everybody else, you know, well, Jesus is a faith-based initiative, or he's one of the options. No, nope, no, nope, that's not it at all. We've, we've missed something, but you keep growing, you keep learning, and then God connected me to certain other people that helped me understand who I was in Christ and what took place in me because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus. And so I'm building something here for you. And Paul says the abundance of the revelations. And for this thing in verse 8, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Like, Lord, it's really tough. Every time I think I'm making progress, I get whacked. I take two steps forward and I get knocked four steps back. When is a guy going to get a break? Everywhere I go, things are being stirred up. I get stoned. I get, I mean, he had all, listen, anybody, people think when you get stoned, you take these cute little rocks and you throw them at people. No, what do you think his eyes were all messed up for? Why do you think? It wasn't some, some eye disease. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's been stoned. He's been left for dead. I mean, Paul had a hit or a contract, contract out on him. People said, we're not eating until we kill him. Has anybody been that mad at you? I take a vow here and now. I will not eat or drink until that man is dead. Whoa, that'll scare you. Buffeting, buffeting. Three times. And God says in verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, God is not saying, heck no, I ain't helping you, boy. What kind of a God does that? The guy's going through hard times here, man. He's experiencing some difficulties, and he asked Daddy to help him, and Daddy says, too bad, so sad. <sighs> no, that's not at all what happened. God said, Paul, my grace really is sufficient for you if you will just be strong in my grace, if you will just retreat back into who you are and understand that circumstances cannot move you. And yet that's what moves us more than anything is how we feel. The circumstances, those are the things that move us. Those, those are the things that motivate us. If, I, if circumstances are ideal, if my body's feeling really good, if the birds are singing, the sky is blue, and my sweetie just told me she loved me, I mean, my God, life is good. Well, what if sweetie hates your stinking guts? And what if it's cloudy and, and miserable and there's another snowstorm coming? And, and, and what if your goldfish just drowned? And, and, and what if you're... What if... And see, we've gotten to a place where if circumstances are good, life is good. Uh-uh, Paul said, we are not moved by what we see. I'm moved only by what I believe. I'm not looking at the things that are down here. I am focused on the things that are there. That's the only way Paul could have done what he did. It's the only thing Paul could have overcome all of the things that he went through is to be focused on the eternal, to maintain an eternal perspective. God... Paul wasn't suffering with some type of a, an eye disease and, and he asked God to heal him. That just violates and goes against the other principles of Scripture that we know. Jesus himself took your infirmities and bare your sickness except for Paul's. 
Jesus himself took and bear except for yours. See, see, the problem is why I'm hammering this so hard is because if you think that Paul the Apostle couldn't get healed by God, then how could you have faith to get your healing? If Paul couldn't get his, who am I? Yeah, well, Paul said he left Trophimus and, and Miletus sick. Yeah, I don't know what, what the circumstances were there. Here's the thing. God is not going to override your will. God is not going to override your confession. And God isn't overriding your seed. Ooh. Your seed matters. What you sow matters. Your confession matters. Because in spite of what you pray, you will always have what you say. You can pray to God, you can make the best confession, but what do you believe in? I don't know what Trophimus believed. I don't know what his deal was. I don't know about my, listen, one thing I told you is what I have come to the conclusion, these, these visions that I personally have had, they have taught me that I don't know what I thought that I knew. The vision when I was at the cross, when I was in Indianapolis preaching at that church, and the next thing I know it, I was at the cross and I was weeping, and, and, and the only appropriate response of my flesh was to weep and wail, and there was, no, there, was no lang there was nothing that I could convey or communicate. The only appropriate response of my flesh and my soul was to just come unglued at the foot of the cross, weeping and wailing because I did not understand it like I thought that I did, hoped that I would, but I didn't understand nothing. And I'm not talking about the physical torture and agony that Jesus went through. I wonder when he was in the garden when he said, Lord, is there any other way for me to do this? <laughs> is there any other way for me to redeem mankind? Is there any other way to me to rem for, for, for me to remedy this? Is there any other way? I wonder if the Lord was, 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 was understanding all and if he was just kind of weighing it all out and realizing what he was going to have to go through. I am sure it had to do not so much with the physical aspect of it. I'm sure it had to do with the separation that he would experience from his father. I don't know what it's like to be separated from God's goodness to you. I don't know what it's like to be in a vacuum where there's, where there's nothing good, there's no peace, there's no nothing from God, there's no light, there's no hope. I don't know what it's like to be stuck in that vacuum where you feel that there is nothing but despair and misery. And I'm wondering if Jesus was understanding all this. It's like, my God, I have emptied myself of divine rights and privileges. I have taken on this human body. I have submitted and subjected myself to this torturous, murderous nonsense. Is there another way to do this? And yet what does Jesus say? Lord, if not, then I'm going to do it your way. Not my will, but your will be done. I mean, all those things that he went through and did for you and me, and then we have the nerve to say, God, I asked God to heal me three times, and he said no. I'm telling you what, I don't have the answer to your problem. I don't know what your deal is. But here's what I do know, is that it does not negate the word of God. Your experience or lack thereof does not alter the faithfulness of the word of God. It does not do it. And one thing I will not do is question God. In all of my pain, and all of my sorrow, and all the things that I have experienced in my life and that I'm going through to this very day, I don't question Him. I say, I don't know why. But if there's something I'm missing, please show me. I don't know why it's taking so long for this to happen or that to happen. I don't know why 25 years later I'm still not seeing some of the things I've been believing for. The question is, are you really believing? Are you really in faith? Are you just hoping? And so you've got to get to the place where you get this violent and passionate where you say, listen, I'm not blaming God. I don't know what my next move is going to be, but here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to question. I'm not going to falter. The thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him wave after wave of opposition to keep him from becoming everything that he saw that he was, to, to keep him from accomplishing everything that Lord, the Lord told him he would accomplish and, and, and he would do. And there's some amazing things that Paul has uh, communicated to us. There's some amazing things that we get and we learn and we see from the Apostle Paul. And, and I, I want to highlight something very quickly because you, you need to understand, at the very least, you just need to understand in Ephesians 
in, in chapter uh, 1, this Ephesians prayer, Paul was talking about visions and revelations. And notice what he, notice what he prays in Ephesians chapter 1. The very first thing he prays here, and, and, as he references in Ephesians chapter 1, and he says in verse number, this is Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here it is, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Some of these things, you have to have it revealed to you. You're not going to just get it by reading somebody's storybook or listening to a teaching series. Some of these things have to be revealed to you. Look at verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know. You're not going to know until your eyes get enlightened. You're not going to know the hope of his calling. You're not going to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You're not going to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he, set him, when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The body of Christ. We're not some, we're not some weak, helpless, powerless thing on this planet. We're not, we're not a, a, a weak organization. We are a living organism. We have him living in us and living through us. We have been made one with him. When I walk, he walks. When I talk, he talks. When I lay my hands on the sick, he lays his hands on the sick. This is the difference. This is the difference maker. And for this thing, he said, Lord, this buffeting is really hard. I know, Paul, but my grace is sufficient for you. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep moving forward. Keep speaking what I've given you to speak. Keep preaching what I've given you to preach. Keep speaking this truth and don't back up off of it. What else is there? What else is there? Are we going to just cop out like everybody else? Are we going to just sell out? Are we going to exchange the, the, the gold for brass? The body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. But it gets even better because as you go to chapter 2, it tells you in verse 6, he hath raised us up together. He hath raised us up. He's not going to. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. This is where you start when you're born again, right here in this seat. This is where you start. This is where you start, but all of the teaching that you, you receive and all of, the, all of the relationships that you develop or neglect, all of the decisions that you make or don't make, they will either keep you firmly seated or they will start bringing you down a notch, bringing you down a notch, bringing you down a notch. I'm just a worthless old sinner. Who am I? I have no rights to be up here. Why would anybody want to listen to me? Because I'm not standing here as Gary. I'm standing here as your pastor, a gift that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to this body. I didn't do it, he did it. I just had to say, yes, I'll accept your assignment, sir. Whatever anybody thinks is irrelevant, but what I think is everything. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. The only thing I care about is what I think about me, because that's what matters, because I am self-governing. I'm self-governing. Visions, revelations, and thorns. <laughs> What's the thorn in the flesh? Well, it's just like saying a real pain in the neck, man. <laughs> or if it makes you feel better, that's a real pain in my keister. Most people use that three-letter word more than the other. Pain in the neck, they use the three-letter word, right? Do I need to be a little bit more? No, I think you understand. That uh, language was used uh, when God had said to the Israelites, you're going to have to deal with these Canaanites, you're going to have to get rid of them, or they're going to be a pain in your neck, a thorn in your side. That language has been used before in the Bible, and never once, never once, has that phrase been connected to physical sickness or disease. Physical sickness or disease. Physical sickness or disease does not have a legal right in your body. 
it does not have a legal right in your body. And we are putting up with and tolerating too much. Well, it's still there, so it must be God's will. Well, maybe God is still deciding whether he wants to heal me, or maybe healing just isn't for everyone, or I don't know what to think. You all keep praying for me, because maybe if enough of us pray, maybe God just might get up off of his blessed assurance and do something for me. And here's the thing, when Terry said, well, I got the report, cancer's come back, it's a good thing you got another report 2,000 years ago that says, by his stripes, you were healed. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy thing. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, and I'm not saying it's not scary, because Lord knows it's anything but easy. But you have to be properly trained and taught and developed to understand that there are just some things that you're going to have to be bold and confident about. And you're going to have to speak the right way. You're going to have to think the right way. You're going to have to act the right way. And one of the greatest revelations that I got, and it's so hard to do, and i got to tell you this, I'm just going to tell you this. It was, we were in Connecticut, and we were staying uh, at some friend's house. And, uh, and any time I've gone out there, I've done some, some visiting and I've done some preaching. And I remember we were just staying there, and they, had, they, were, they let us stay in their home, and they were away on, 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 a, on a ministry trip or somewhere. And so <clears throat> it just so happens that our friend Peter McDonald, was in town as well and so we got together and something hit me in my back it 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 felt like someone put a dagger or sword down through uh, my my shoulder and ran it right through my back and it crippled me and I was in such agony that I didn't know what I was going to do we were getting ready to call the ambulance and so you know I've got my wife I've got Peter I've got Sharon and they're all praying and interceding and I'm I'm there in agony I was like you know I've, at first you're afraid you're going to die but then then you're afraid you're not going to die and I just remember thinking this is nothing more than an attack from the devil and Peter came into the room. He says, brother, I'm just really impressed that this is just a a spiritual attack on you. I said, well, that confirms it. So now what do I do? I need help. I need relief. Should we call the ambulance? And what are they going to do? I can't even think about moving. I can't even think about shifting anything here. And and, and so I remember, (laughs) I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do, but here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to say, oh, well, I guess I, I, three times I, I besought him and he said, no, my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to pull that, that card, that, that uh, false card out of the deck and show it to you. And I just remember, it's been an hour, within the hour, time for you to get up now. I'm like, what? Start moving. Why would God tell me to do that? Do you not see the pain I'm in, Lord? Do you not understand the agony, the anguish? It feels like there is a sword, a dagger that has run right down into my back. I can't even, I don't even know what to say. And you're saying, well, within the hour. First he said, within the hour, within the hour, within the hour. And then the hour came and went. And I said, that didn't change nothing. He said, now it's time for you to move. And it occurred to me, faith without corresponding action is dead. I said, son of a beep. That's what I felt like saying. I just said, son of a gun. I said, I believe the Lord said to me within the hour, within the hour, within the hour, the hour came and went. Now he said, okay, now you got to get up and move. I said, "He, he wants me to get up and move. And I went from the den. I don't even know how I did it. I just got up and I shuffled into the kitchen and I sat down. And that was all I could do. You know, there may be a point in your life when all you can do is just... Because the pain is so intense, your body's so crippled up. I would suggest you do it. Because faith without corresponding action or the appropriate response is really dead. Because what you're saying is, oh, I believe, but I don't believe I'm able to get up. Oh, I believe, but... It's funny how when you're gone through surgery or something and you want to be left alone and they're in there poking and prodding, you got to breathe, you got to get up, you got to move. What? I just had surgery. I don't care. Blow into this thing. What? Now you got to get up. What? It's a principle. I'm telling you. Too many Christians are stuck right there. Oh, I got faith. Oh, I believe. But I can't get out of bed. I'm trying to help you. Himself took and bare. What does that mean to you? 
It ain't yours to have. It ain't yours to bear. If you want to hang on to it, the worst thing, the worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you take possession of your sickness. It's my cancer. Your cancer? What are you doing with it? It's my cold. It's my sinus infection. It's my massive migraine headache. It's my bad back. It's my, it's my sciatica. Well, you do have a sciatica, right? But yet we equate that with misery and pain and discomfort. Listen, I'm trying to help you. Because I have to walk this thing out just like you do. And I am telling you, if you knew, if you could only see the battles I've had to go through, and we'll be done in just a minute here. If, if you could see the battles I've had to go through, the wars that have been waged, if you could see the things that I've had to press through, you'd be like, huh, I thought he got an, exempt, an exemption from all this. No, I'm just the dude that the devil wants to take out. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Can you imagine if Paul didn't rely on the grace of God and gave in and gave up? We wouldn't be reading about this. Oh, you'd be okay because you'd have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'd have some of Peter's writings and all, right? But you wouldn't have the Pauline. Can you imagine not having the Pauline revelation? I mean, that's what holds it all together. It's like, wow, that all makes sense now. I get it now. So as you look up at the cross, when you take communion, you're looking up and you're saying, oh my God, it's already been done. The price that he paid. What's happened here? What's happened here is that Jesus was made to be something that you don't have to be, something that you don't have to endure anymore. He bore the penalty. He took the curse. The Bible says that now, I'll tell you what, <laughs> for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not just the removal of your sin or the covering of your sin. Now it includes everything. For by grace are ye saved through faith. You have to operate the same way when you came to Jesus for the first time. If you're going to receive healing or any other benefit or blessing, you're going to have to do it the same way. You're going to have to receive it the same way. You mean you died for me, sir? You mean your blood was shed for me so that I could have my sins washed away? I want that. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want my sins washed away. And just because your sins get washed away doesn't mean you live victorious now. Now you have to walk it out, don't you? So when we take communion, what are we saying? We're saying, I'm just a wishing and a hoping and a thinking. No, I'm saying thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm saying thank you. I don't know what Paul heard up there. He wasn't able to, he, it's stuff that's not lawful to utter. I, I, I don't really understand all that. I don't know all that. I don't understand everything about salvation that I thought that I did. I don't really understand everything about the cross that I thought that I did. But the glimmers that I get, the little bit that he gives me, it is my job to hold on to it. I'm not trying to get saved anymore. I'm already saved. I'm not trying to get healed anymore. I'm already healed. Now, I don't want to tolerate symptoms. I don't want to put up with symptoms. I don't want things to be off in my body and in my mind. Do you? Thank God he's given us a way to make it right. He's given us a way to press through all these things. And it all has to do with action. 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 If you believe that Jesus saved you, if you believe that he, his blood shed, uh, washed, washed away all your sins, what do you do? You just lay there and say, oh, ain't that lovely, it's so nice. Or do you say, sir, I received that. Thank you for dying for me. I mean, some of, some of you probably said the same words. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you that your blood was shed for me. I received you as my Lord and Savior now. I want you in my heart and life. You had to bust a move. You had to take the first step. You had to make it your own. Well, healing is no different.